Wayne Williams, welcome to Colorado Mesa University in our Civic Forum series of discussions. So glad you could be here. It's good to be back here again. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, so uh, you are spending some more time here in Mesa County on a, um, helping our elections division currently, but you've got a long history of public service. Um, Tell our campus and community a little bit about your career as a public servant. Well, I started actually serving in elections on a canvas board in 1997. Okay. We had the punch card ballots. You had a very specific list of when it counted, when it didn't. And so a few years later in Florida in 2000, uh, when they were using punch card ballots and they were trying to change the rules in the middle of the game, it kind of stuck in my craw because in Colorado, we had systems and processes, and you knew what the rules were, and yeah. you followed the rules. Uh, ultimately, I later served as an El Paso County Commissioner, and then as the clerk and recorder in El Paso County, which is the state's most populous. Uh, ran elections there, ran elections in Sawatch County in the San Luis Valley when they needed someone to help. So both a very large county and a very small county. Uh, and uh, then served as Colorado's 38th Secretary of State. Uh, I now serve on the Colorado Springs City Council, but also work as an elections official. I've helped out some special districts and now have the opportunity to help out the people of Mesa County. Well, we're glad you're here and, and appreciate you taking a quick minute away from your work uh, to chat with our campus community and really talk about um, an issue that I think has become so relevant around elections. So so let's dive right in. You you are, uh, for all intents and purposes, one of the preeminent experts in Colorado, running Colorado elections. Um, close elections are nothing new to us, right? Dewey, Truman, <laughs> Kennedy, Nixon, Bush v. Gore that you just referenced, these are close elections over time. Seldom right? Hayes, if you want to go back even farther. Uh, and even here, uh, we've had close elections here in Colorado. So our governor, uh, got his start in political office running for regent and or rather state board of education oh that's right and he won yeah. by 90 votes over senator ben alexander from the southwest part of the state 90 votes in a statewide race we've had other races in colorado that have been settled by a tie mm. uh, and so we draw lots unless you're in cripple creek they had a tie race they drew high card really uh, and so yes we have very close races that's sometimes amazing. It's not new. There are lots of races that aren't, but mm -hmm. the ones that, of course, get the publicity are the ones that are very close. And that's what causes members of the public and elected officials and election officials to look at it and say, are there ways we can make this better? How mm -hmm. do we assure the public that the results are accurate? So you, you referenced Bush v. Gore. And my recollection at that time, as you said, was a punch ballot. And I think we had the same in Colorado for some time. Um, you know, this is 20 plus years ago. But how has that, how has literally the, the process of um, casting and counting ballots changed over time here in Colorado? So there have been lots of different ways in which uh, ballots have been counted. Uh, the punch card, you would, uh, and of course, some of the, certainly some of the students at CMU have never had to use a punch card on a computer. I don't know what a hanging uh, chad is, or right? Or hanging chad. <laughs> uh, but you would literally had a little stylus and you would punch through and punch out a piece of paper uh, rec that recorded your vote. And if you didn't fully punch it or if it caught, it would be a hanging chad, as it was called. And so there had to be standards for what happened. After this occurred... Congress passed the Help America Vote Act, and President Bush signed that. Uh, that provided some new standards that needed to be applied. It set up the Election Assistance Commission, which mm -hmm. is a federal agency in Washington, uh, whose leaders are two Republicans and two Democrats, and they work together to work with election officials across the country to establish certain standards. Uh, so over time, we've moved to computers at one point and then we've moved away from them. Uh, when I was Secretary of State, we went back to requiring actual paper ballots for every vote that is cast. Hmm. Uh, and part of that challenge is you have to make a ballot that is accessible to someone who may have a disability. And so we have what are called touchscreen ballot marking devices uh, in which you can go in and you can 
get audio help or visual help I with see. a ballot. I see. Uh, you make your preferences known. It then marks it, prints out the ballot for you, and you have a chance as the voter or with, uh, if you need to, to have an opportunity to review it. And you can see, did it accurately record my votes? So this audit trail idea is not new, right? This goes back to old times when you could count a physical ballot. But of course, when you're counting in Colorado, three million plus ballots, this becomes a little bit of a challenge, right? So how, how does that happen today? It is. So you have the actual physical ballots, and those are the actual record of the election. How you count them uh, varies from place to place. Uh, in Colorado, in some very tiny counties, hmm. up until just a few years ago, you had hand counting taking place. Now we have that as a last resort where you can do that because you've got the physical ballot. Yep. But all of them use a tabulation machine. That tabulation machine is certified by the Election Assistance Commission. All of its code and every part of it is certified. It goes through testing by an independent lab okay. that must prove that it tallies accurately. Yep. But that's not enough for us in Colorado because in every election we also check the machine and we do it twice. We do it before with what's called a logic and accuracy test. Okay. We'll be doing that as a public test in first week of October here in Mesa County. Every county in the state does that. Who, uh, who is it that's inspecting that logic sure. test? Uh, the, each party, each of the two major parties, appoints a member of the board. I see. And we run sample ballots through and see if it tabulates them accurately. Uh, and so that's the first step. Okay. And those are sample ballots. And you may have heard in, in New York they had an issue with the mayoral race where mm -hmm. they had included the sample ballots in their one of their counts, and that caused some consternation, as it should have, because yep. it should not have been counted as part of it. Yeah. Uh, but, but in the Colorado, fact that they were able to see, catch, and yep. correct that error tells you the system maybe in some regards is working. And, and, and you can do that because you've actually got the paper ballots. Mm -hmm. You're not just trusting the ether, you're not trusting yeah, yeah. a code that could have been manipulated, you actually have the paper ballots. So in Colorado, we test that before, we conduct the election, we announce results, we announce initial results, and mm -hmm. then there's a signature process, and we'll talk about that if we've got time. Uh, but once those ballots are counted and tabulated, we then do something called a risk limiting audit and that's a process that was established in Colorado law but hadn't been done yet until I became Secretary of State mm. and we established this where we go and based on the closeness of the race tell each county clerk and their bipartisan judges mm -hmm. to go pull specific ballots and compare those to the cast vote record that's in the machine so we can look and we can say this says that for, you know, we switched to electing CMU president uh, on, in a ballot. So John Marshall got one vote. We could pull up the ballot and we say, did this ballot have a vote for John Marshall? And we say, yes, it did. So that one's correct. The closer the race, the more ballots we pull. I see. And that's on some kind of a percentage basis then? It's on a percentage basis. The, and there's a formula. It's an open source code that actually tells the clerk, go pull the fourth ballot in the third box, the eighth and twelfth ballot in the fifth box. And we're randomly and these are selected. St statistical algorithms that St are, yep. that are, okay, so for any student who's questioning their decision to major in statistics, here is further evidence why we need them. There are purposes, and mm, for those right. who like multi-sided dice, uh, we actually determine the random seed by rolling 20 10-sided dice to come up with a actual random seed wow. uh, that's done in a public meeting with different people rolling so that no one knows which are the ballots that are going to be tested and which are the ballots that are going to be done. And this is in an open source code, by the way, so mm -hmm. it is publicly available. We actually go back to the root ballot. Uh, we don't use the machine code or anything else. We mm -hmm. go back and we hold the physical paper ballot and we look to see, does the, does, do the votes on this ballot match what the machine says? Uh, between the logic and accuracy tests and that risk limiting audit, we have now tested the Dominion voting system, which simply tabulates votes mm -hmm. 868 times in Colorado, because each county conducts this test independently. Okay. And it is passed 868 out of 868 times. That's a better percentage than my GPA was in college. <laughs> uh, 
But it's an important part of that process because it's not just trust us, it's right, we can verify it. Sure. Other things that we've done uh, and what we're going to do in Mesa County is we're then going to put ballot images online. Oh, okay. uh, so that if you want to hand count the ballots yourself, you can print them all out and have a bunch of friends over and count them. Good heavens. We're also going to do a formal hand count uh, of the ballot this fall so that we can verify to everyone's, mm. to most everyone's satisfaction that it, the machines tabulated the results accurately. Wayne, you're describing a, a system of layered belt and suspender um, fail safes and extra measures and transparency that I'm not sure everybody understands. I mean, this is a lot going into this. Is this common? Is Colorado's process common or are we something of a leader in the country? Uh, both President Trump's Homeland Security Sec Secretary, Kirsten Nielsen, and the Washington Post, so I'm giving you two contrasting views, okay. called Colorado the safest state in which to vote hmm. because we have these additional precautions I that see. other states don't have. We were the first state in the nation to have a risk full statewide risk limiting audit. Mm. Uh, we pioneered a number of processes with respect to paper ballots because we want people to be able to actually verify that vote yep. themselves. Yep. And then if there's a question on the results, to have those paper ballots as the ultimate way. By the way, if the risk limiting audit shows that there are discrepancies, it eventually leads to a full hand count. Uh, and that's part of so the statewide process. So if you can demonstrate process. that there's some smoke, we're going to go in and take a look at that if you've got the election officials' attention in that regard. Talk, talk to me about, for normal people, We Colorado now um, is an all-mail ballot state, right? So I get my ballot sent to my house, and I fill that ballot out. How do I ensure that my ballot is not, um, somebody else isn't submitting a ballot under my name, or that I haven't submitted a ballot under someone else's name? So good questions. So let's start with how you get that ballot sent to your house. Uh, and this is probably relevant to some students here, maybe saying, hey, I'm here in Grand Junction. Yep. I live on the Front Range. Where do I vote? And the answer is uh, one of those places, not both, because that would then be a crime. Yep. Don't want to do you, that. You get to pick one. You can you pick can one. Vote at home, or you can vote on campus. And you can have whichever ballot you want sent to you. So okay. you can go to govotecolorado.gov. Okay. You can either change your registration to Mesa County, if that's what you wanted to mm -hmm. do as a CMU student, mm -hmm. or you can simply change your mailing address so you can remain an Arapahoe County voter, have the ballot sent to you here. I see. And then you can either mail it back to Arapahoe County, or you can actually turn it in to the Dropbox that's right here on campus. Hmm. If you're anywhere in the state of Colorado and it's in that Dropbox by 7 p.m. on Election Day, it counts. One of the great things about that is you don't have to depend upon will the mail service get it back there in time. Yep. You can be assured that it's there, that it's counted. And the reason why you might want to do that, yes, you can still vote in person, but sometimes all of your friends decide to do that at the same time. <laughs> and that can cause a lot. And people can choose. And I know no students here ever procrastinate. I occasionally did when I was in school. Uh, and so people will procrastinate. They will yeah. all want to vote at the last second. You can turn in that mail ballot that's been mailed to you at the last minute, and there's no line for that. Once you turn that ballot in, we then begin a verification process. First of all, it's picked up either from the post office or from the ballot drop box. Which, which is are, on campus, right over here by Moss Performing Arts, right, right yep. off 12th Street. Yep. You can also drop it off anywhere else you want in the state. <laughs> that's great. Uh, but it, for, if you're a student, it's really convenient here. Yeah. And, and that's true. They're, we're by election offices. Uh -huh. uh, they're, they're publicized where they are. And it's picked up by a bipartisan team of judges. And one of the critical factors we have in Colorado is throughout the process bipartisan judges. So you've got a Democrat and Republican who are going there together. Mm -hmm. They're making sure they grab the ballots out of the ballot box. They put it in a sealed container. They mark it. And so then they drive together. Mm. Even during COVID, hmm. you had to have this exception. Uh, they would drive together to return those ballots to the counting room where it is under video surveillance from that point forward. Uh, 
The next thing that happens the, is that the counting room, just to take a quick detour, is under video surveillance. Mm -hmm. This is a room that not everybody has access to. So there's only certain folks who are able to both access it and those who've been credentialed to access it then are under video surveillance. Is that right? That is absolutely correct. Okay. You cannot walk in off the street. Okay. Um, you can get access as a election judge. Okay. Those are appointed by both of the major political parties. Uh, you can also get access as a watcher. Okay. And so you can be appointed as a watcher by a candidate or an issue committee and say, I want to come in and have this person come in and observe on my behalf. So both campaigns, if, if we're back to Bush v. Gore, both campaigns are allowed to have these poll watchers there so they, can't, they don't get to participate but they are granted access to watch. Right. Okay. They're granted access to watch, but they also appointed the judges. Mm -hmm. So we have, I think, six full-time employees in the elections division right here in Mesa County. Okay. That's not enough to do all this work. So those, all of those judges are actually appointed by the parties as well. Okay. And again, you've got bipartisan teams. Once that ballot arrives, it's scanned in. You'll notice there's a barcode on the ballot envelope. That scanning in does two things. First, it allows you to go vote Colorado.gov, and you can find out, did they get my ballot? Oh, and okay. And it'll say, I didn't know your that. ballot's been received. So if I go on to go vote Colorado.gov, .gov, after election night, I can go and, and look and see if it's been scanned in and it's being tabulated. You can wait till then, or you can do that within a day or two of when you turned it in. Really? So that's happening in real time as you're yes. leading up to the election. Okay. Which, by the way, you asked, how do we know that someone hasn't voted before? Because right. this is happening right. in real time. Yep. So then if you walked in and you, you forgot that you dropped off the ballot uh, and you walk into Voter Service and Polling Center to vote in person, they're going to say, uh, Mr. Marshall, it appears that you've already voted. Do you recall turning this in? Got it. Oh, yeah, I did. Okay. Um, and, and so... How do they know it's me? Would that be an opportunity? And, and how would you validate that, in fact, I was the one that submitted that? So, good question. What you have, the second thing they do after they scan it in, is that scanning pulls up your signature that's on file. Okay. And that signature that's on the envelope is compared to your signature on file. If it does not match, the voter is sent a letter saying, your voter, your signature does not match. Mm -hmm. And so when someone says, well, there could be thousands of ballots turned in from a dumpster, true, but we would catch those. And actually in Colorado, there Ass are. Assuming those dumpster, those dumpster ballots had uh, signatures that didn't match. Right. If they do match, then it's a valid, right. and, valid and so, ballot. Someone grabbing a bunch of ballots out of a dumpster isn't going to know what signature to put on them and how that person signs sure, their name. Sure, sure. Uh, and so in, in Colorado, if it doesn't match, we send the voter a letter. And we say, Dear Wendy, my own daughter is one of these, who I sent a letter to as the El Paso County clerk. <laughs> Your signature does not match. And when Wendy got her ballot, she carefully filled out or got her driver's license, very proud day, you know, signed all the letters, and by the time she was a student in college, it was a scrawl, and it did not match. So as a 16-year-old, which is when that signature was captured, yep. she had excellent penmanship, and as a, what, 20-something college kid, maybe less so. It had changed. So it looked different enough. It, that looked it different. caught the election judge's yes. attention, and they said, right. this needs further and so what happens is someone catches that, huh. it is then flagged, a bipartisan team of judges review it, they say it does not match. So I remember actually walking back into the room where we were doing the verification, commending the judges for appropriately not counting my daughter's ballot because it did not count. But in Colorado, we give you a chance to cure. Okay. And so she has until eight days after the election, and she did, to verify that yes, this is indeed me. So you can... Some kind of affidavit process. Affidavit, says, you can send a copy of your driver's license. Got it. Something that verifies this actually... That was me. That was, was my you. ballot. That's my intended vote. Yep. Got it. And so, if, by the way, this voter doesn't respond to the letter, we refer it over to the DA for them to investigate. Well, um, and there are instances where, you know, a spouse might sign their spouse's ballot. Mm. Uh, because they deposit their checks and they think they can do that, and the DA or their investigator explains, no ma'am, no sir, you're not allowed to do that, please don't do that anymore. And this is a crime. It's a crime. What, what is the crime? Uh, 
it's an election offense to uh, misrepresent whose ballot it is. Okay. And uh, if it's done with intent, it actually rises to a higher level crime sure. of that makes fraud. Sense. Yep. And so it's a crime to do it. It's also a crime to have a greater crime to have the intent to defraud. Uh, and we just had actually a Court of Appeals decision affirming the distinction between these two offenses. Makes sense. Don't do it. Uh, <laughs> Don't do but it. But the prosecutor a lot of times will say, okay, I'm not going to prosecute the spouse. They weren't maliciously intending it. Mm. And I'm, we're going to tell them they can't do it again. Mm. And the person says, oh, yeah, I'm never going to do that again yeah. now that I know. Uh, can, can you pause for a minute sure. there, Wayne? In that... Uh, in that process where we're going through all these fail-safes to ensure the integrity of these elections, in any given cycle, um, on a percentage basis, whether in Sawatch, El Paso, or statewide, how, what are we talking about? How many folks are actually trying to defraud an election from one cycle to the next? So there are three categories of these mail ballots. One is the spouse or another family member who signs, not realizing they're not allowed to do that. Got they're it. not trying to vote for the person. They were told, drop this off, and they realize they're... Take care of my ballot, sweetheart. And yep. I got it. That, there's that category. There is a category of people whose signatures just simply changed, like my daughter's. Okay. Uh, and then there's a category that we don't know who they are, where someone might have actually found a ballot, tried to turn it in, but we don't know who did turn it in. And so in Colorado, we are successful in capturing all of those that are improper, yeah. or at least 99.9% .9 of them, and so they never count. Successful fraud is pretty rare. Yeah. Uh, attempts, whether intentional or inadvertent, Got it. Uh, occur much more often, but in Colorado, we successfully prevent those ballots from being counted. You've got all these layers of protection to catch those and and I think what I'm hearing you say is those folks where whereby I've checked in the ballot but the signatures don't match virtually all of those are getting caught cleared right. out and cleared out appropriately right and so what you wind up with then is a very small percentage it's a fraction of a fraction of a percent uh, where they either evaded the signature verification process okay. or we did a study with Washington and Oregon and a couple other states. Those two were the other mail ballot states. In which we found <coughs> in the 2016 presidential election, there were 38 people in the state of Colorado who appeared to have voted in Colorado and one other state. Oh. So, and those were again referred to the, the DAs for prosecution. 38 out of 3 million. 38 out of 3 million, roughly. And so it is not widespread, but most people don't rob banks. But when you go into a bank, they don't have the money sitting in a pile for you to walk away with. They have precautions. That's right. Most people don't commit election fraud, <coughs> but as election officials, we work very hard to ensure it does not occur. Yeah. And if it does, then we prosecute. So one of the things that um, you, know, you, you think about over time is these contentious elections are not new to our republic, right? These, these uh, really hyper-close elections have been happening, as, as we've described, for years. What, what is it about the politicization, politicization of the actual process of casting and counting ballots that has changed insofar as now all of a sudden I hear normal people talking about Dominion voting systems, which is an exceptionally obscure uh, sort of, as you said, tabulation machine, but all of a sudden now these kind of things are, are in the common parlance and, and in the political discourse. What, how did that happen and, and what do you, in your estimation, I mean you do this stuff for a living, what are the consequences potentially of this? So I, I think you certainly have increased scrutiny and, and that occurs for a number of reasons. One of those is you have a 24-7 news cycle in which there is much greater coverage of things that may have happened mm. in another state. So, you know, if you go back to the founding of the country, whether Pennsylvania checked absentee ballots for signature or not, uh, which and those, those actually came out around the Civil War when soldiers who were fighting for their nation should be able to vote. Uh, but we wouldn't know what those processes were in mm. each state. And in fact, uh, 
we were pretty loose with how we looked at things in other states, and that was part of the benefit of the Electoral College is that each state kind of ran their own processes. Over time, co Congress began to say, look, there are some things we're going to ensure happen. We want to make sure that someone with a disability has the opportunity to vote. We want to make sure that you're not discriminating based on race or religion or previous condition of servitude. And so there were a host of things that Congress stepped in at various times uh, to, more, to, to establish some federal minimum standards. The other thing that's happened, though, is you've got an increasing role of the government, mm -hmm. which makes them, the elections more important. You have an increasingly large way for people to gain knowledge. Mm -hmm. And you also have uh, a much broader array of the media. And so it used to be, when I was growing up, you had a few networks, and Walter, Walter Cronkite would announce, and that's the way it is. Tuesday, November 6th, and you would go, well, Walter Cronkite said so. He said, that's the way it is. All right, um, moving on. And so you had more of a uh, judgment discretion exercised by networks uh, because there were just a few of them, uh, and they weren't trying to fill, they're trying to fill 23 minutes mm. as opposed to 24-7. Now you have where everyone can be their own news source. Yeah. Uh, I can uh, post a picture saying, machines are shut down, no voting being allowed. And I say that because I got a call that this was happening, and I followed up. The, the judges were changing the paper, were adding paper to the machine. It was not shut down. They were, were just going, pausing and they're pausing re reloading so they could supplies. Add paper. Uh, so more ballots could be printed. Sure, uh, sure. And, and so when we, uh, particularly as we pass on things that we may not have personal knowledge of, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's part of the, the responsibility that each of us have and as we become our own news sources through our, our social media feeds and other things to say, do I know this happened? What evidence do I have? What information do I have? Yeah. Um, and that's part of it. And then when you get into some of the analytics that take place in the computer world, uh, if I have a particular point of view, I am shown things that agree with my particular point of view. And we, we had that discussion. We had a screening a few months ago as part of our civic forum of uh, a documentary called The Social Dilemma and really parsed that concept out, which is um, troubling and, and maybe telling that that we're sitting here talking about it directly in the context of ballot integrity and voting. It is, and actually, I, I saw that movie actually a screening with a number of attorney generals from across the mm. country that took place at the Broadmoor. Uh, that Phil Weiser, who I think is one of your other guests here, yeah. uh, was helping to sponsor. And uh, it, it is a challenge because a lot of times there's not a lot of vetting done before someone posts something or reposts something. Yeah. Um, and because we have, through our own choices and the media we get and the feeds that were sent, as was talked about in there, I don't often hear the contrasting view. Yeah. And so I believe that everybody must have my opinion. And so if what I thought should have happened, the election didn't happen, it must be because there was something improper. And you saw that in 2016 from Democrats who could not believe that Donald Trump had been elected, and you saw that in 2020 from Republicans that could not believe that Joe Biden had been elected. Yeah. Uh, as an election official, there's not much that I can do to change the media world or social media habits or anything else like that. But, but, you, but you are aware, as an elect election official, of the exceptional lengths that you've just described here, uh, that election officials are going to to ensure the accuracy of the vote. You're aware of those things. And most election, most elected officials would also be aware of this, right? Yes. Um, and so part of what we want to do, and part of the reason I'm glad you invited me to come on today, is to talk about this process that we have where we have verification of signatures, where all of the counting's done under video surveillance, where it's done by bipartisan judges, 
where we have a paper ballot that is an audit trail mm -hmm. that allows us to verify those results are accurate. All of those things are critical parts. And it's important really for two factors, John. One of them is we, of course, want the election to be accurate. Absolutely critical. Absolutely first. accurate. But the second part is I also want people to know that it's accurate. And it's not just, I don't just want you to know it's accurate when the person you wanted wins. Mm. I want you to know that it's accurate when Maybe the person. Maybe more, more important even. More important, when right, lose, when the right? other person won. So you know you lost fair and square. So you know you lost fair and square. Yeah. And that's why we've added those verification processes mm -hmm. like the risk limiting audit. It's why we established voter verifiable paper ballots to require an actual way for you to tell that your ballot was counted. It's why we make it accessible to you to know whether your ballot was received. And also it tells you when your signature has been cleared. Uh, so all of those are steps we take to try not just to have an accurate election, but also to assure the people, the citizens. Yeah, know it. Know it, because if you yeah. believe it's accurate, you are much more likely to participate, much more likely to vote, and that's something I think we all want. So democracy depends on all of this working appropriately. I guess the other question that comes to mind is we live in, uh, you know, f amongst federated states, and so we have elections that are administered right, by way of federalism, meaning that the federal government doesn't administer these. These are administered by the states and the sub political subdivisions of the states known as counties. And um, Colorado is on the opposite end of the spectrum where, as you've gone to, to great detail to help us understand, if all of these checks and balances to ensure these are accurate, what's the argument for keeping these localized rather than taking what the good work, best in class things that are happening here and applying them everywhere. So there are differences from state to state. So mm -hmm. we run elections at the county level. There are other states that run them at the township level. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you've got a, a very different system. Uh, we are very supportive of mail ballots in Colorado. Our citizens, even before we mailed everyone a ballot, s over 70% had said, please always send me a mail ballot. Hmm. And part of that's because we like to make choices, and Colorado gives you choices. You have initiatives. So in Mesa County, for example, there will be a question of, shall we allow marijuana cultivation to take place in the unincorporated county? There will also be a question that says, shall taxes be increased so that we can tax this marijuana cultivation if it takes place? So you as a citizen are asked to make financial decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, our largest school district here in Mesa County has an issue about a bond to replace a high school. And so you're being asked to decide, shall they borrow this money at this rate with this repayment to do these processes? Yeah. And, and lots of people say, I don't want to stand in a polling place and figure this out. Yeah. I want it sent to me. I can sit at home. I can do research. I can go by and look at the school and say, yeah, that needs to repla be replaced, or I can go by and look at it and say, no, it doesn't. Well, and maybe you've just made the case, but um, what would Washington, D.C. possibly know about 5th and North and Grand Junction High School and the bond language approved by a local school board and things like that, yeah? And they don't, and in some places you don't get to make those choices. Mm. So right in Colorado we also say, uh, shall so-and-so who's the justice of the Colorado Supreme Court be retained in office, and you decide. Do you like her? Do you not like her? And, and so you're asked to make many more decisions, and mm -hmm. so we like voting by mail. New Hampshire is almost all in person, and they have, along with Colorado, one of the highest turnouts in America. Hmm. So their voters like to vote differently. They come in person. They come Cultural. to the polling place. Yep. Our voters like to vote via mail. Uh, even though we offer in-person voting, over 90% in every Colorado election since we've done this has chosen to vote the mail ballot they were sent. Well, it is nice doing that in the comfort of your living room, right? It is, and you can talk about it. You, you know, I've sat around the table talking to the kids about different issues. And, yeah, you bet. And, it's a great opportunity to chat with your family about yep. it. Yeah, in fact, uh, one of our kids ultimately uh, got AP government class from growing up in the... <laughs> he took the AP government test without ever taking the class because he'd pick up enough growing up in the family well, and you, got college credit you, for it. You might be on the, uh, what do we call those, on the margins a little bit. <laughs> but part of this, right, is different states do things differently. Yeah. 
Uh, Alaska, I was at, uh, I was actually on a family cruise, but I, being the elections geek that I am, went to the elections office when we stopped in Juneau. Hmm. And uh, they were preparing ballots to go out. But they have communities in Alaska that get air service once a week. And so that ballot must be on that plane that day or it's not going to get there for a whole nother week. Yeah, it makes so sense. their standards are different than ours. Yeah. And so well, different a... places have those different standards. And it is always one of the challenges. But, you know, we have the crime of murder is defined individually by state. It's a state issue. Mm -hmm. um, should elections. And there are arguments on both sides. I know that there have been some various bills in Congress that have addressed this. Uh, one of the ones that had passed in the House of Representatives actually invalidates Colorado's signature verification process, hmm. um, which annoys me because I think this is an important step in the elections. Well, I think you described a process whereby it's helped you cap, catch and avoid mm -hmm. fraud. Yep. And, and that's, you know, I don't want to prosecute fraud. I want to avoid it at the very beginning yeah. so that you, as a voter, can be confident in those returns. Mm -hmm. I, I will say, John, sometimes someone says, well, how did you count my ballot? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> because when that ballot, when the, when the signature clears, the ballot's removed from the envelope. Yeah. It is then segregated so that your secret ballot is protected. And that's a right guaranteed in the Colorado Constitution. Yeah. So I don't know how your individual ballot was voted. What I do know is that I have all of the paper ballots. They were under video surveillance. You have a chain of custody. Here's the, here's the chain of custody, yeah. and here are the results. And Wayne, as, as we think about this, and you know, obviously we're, we're here in early September, and um, we want to see our students vote. Mm -hmm. We want to see our community vote. We've got, as you said, important issues, Grand Junction High School on the ballot. Um, so important that we are able to continue to create confidence uh, among our electorate, among our community, to know that their ballots are being, um, what the, the ballot as they cast it is being received accurately, is being recorded accurately, and that the election is being administered accurately. And I think you've laid that out for us. We're grateful so, uh, to have you here, Wayne. You're a good friend and a, and a great public servant. Colorado's lucky to have you. Thank you for coming to Colorado Mesa University and participating in our civic forum. We're so grateful. Thanks for having me here. It's always great to be back at CMU. Come back soon. Thanks.